world is swept away. Which wouldn't be a problem if we weren't blown away when the world gets swept away. We hang on to little bits and pieces of the world, and when they get swept away, we go along with them. And the good news of the Buddha's teaching is it doesn't have to be that way. So many times the Buddha is accused of being pessimistic. But the whole import of the Four Noble Truths is that you don't have to suffer. You don't have to get blown away. At the very least, suffering is manageable. As someone once said, the third and a half noble truth, when you haven't quite gotten all the way to the third truth, is that suffering is manageable. But it requires training the mind. In other words, you can't run away from it, you can't escape it, you can't pretend that it's not there. Because the more you pretend that it's not there, the more it's going to sneak up on you. Aging, illness, and death. We often think of these things as something way off in the distance. But they have a way of barging into the present moment, right in your face. And if you're not prepared, you get freaked out. Whatever emotion comes up in the mind seems to overwhelm you. It seems to be more than you can handle. And so you grasp after straws. As the Buddha once said, our normal reaction to suffering is one, bewilderment. And then two, looking outside for somebody to give you advice. If it's looking for advice, you're fine. If you're looking for someone else who's just going to take the suffering away, that's a problem. Because the real suffering is not caused by things outside, it's by how we react to them. And that's a question of our own lack of skill. No one can come in and make you skillful. Skillful is, skillfulness is something you have to develop from within, which is what we're working on here, giving the mind a good, solid foundation that's not going to get blown away. At the very least, with some concentration, you can have a sense of the observer that just watches the events of the world and doesn't feel obliged to get in and get involved. And we develop that observer by being mindful. You focus on the breath. Breath comes in, breath goes out. Whatever the breath is going to do, you be aware of it. Keep in mind that this is where you want to be. It's not that we're here to get the breath, but we're going to learn a lot of interesting things about the mind as you try to stay focused here. Other thoughts are going to come up, for sure. And you need skill in learning how to not get sucked in by them. Sometimes you can simply notice the fact, oh, here comes another thought. That in and of itself helps separate you out. And if the thought's not too overwhelming or too in your face, that can be enough to just be done with it. Other times, though, it keeps coming back, coming back, coming back. And that's when you've got to look at the drawbacks of looking at that kind of thought, getting involved in that kind of thought. Where is it going to lead you? Is it going to help you or is it going to harm you? Again, this helps to separate you a little bit more. You begin to see that this is a process. It's going to lead you someplace, and you've got to have a good active imagination to picture where it's going to lead you. This is one of the places where imagination has a very useful role in the meditation. A lot of the reason why people get addicted to drugs, to alcohol, to other things is that they refuse to imagine the drawbacks. All they can see is how easy it is to take the drug and how you're going to be away from the problem for a while. And they refuse to imagine what's going to happen afterwards. And 
it's that same impulse that makes people run for rituals, a ritual that's going to take away your karma. Or someone who's going to come down and forgive you and erase all your mistakes from the past. So you're going to have to think about the results of your actions. It's very appealing, but it's, it shows an unwillingness to use your imagination, to think about, okay, what are the consequences going to be? Where are these things going to lead? In other words, the Buddha is encouraging you to keep a level head no matter what happens. That you can face the consequences and say, yeah, I could survive that. There's so many problems in life where we say, oh, I just couldn't stand that. It would kill me to have that happen. I wouldn't be able to handle it. That's a defeatist thought, and it causes you more problems than you might imagine. When the events come, you discover, hey, yes, you can handle it. Then you might feel guilty. Gee, I'm being too competent. I'm not being sensitive enough to the issue. Well, no, you've got to be competent in order to be helpful. In other words, whatever thoughts come up, you say, where is that thought going to lead? Look at it as a pattern of cause and effect. So you don't have to identify with the thought. When you don't identify with it, then the wind comes and catches the thought. When the world gets swept away and sweeps that thought away with it, you're not swept away as well. All the other techniques for dealing with distracted thoughts are precisely for this, to get you in control of the ways of your thinking so that you can think the thoughts that you want to think and you don't have to think the thoughts you know are going to be harmful. Because that's actually what, is what gets you swept away. Without those thoughts, the, your state of awareness is perfectly fine. But it's your sense of possession. You own this thought, or you own this person, you own that relationship. It's like a little parachute. It catches the wind and blows you away. If you're going to identify with anything, identify with a sense of just the knowing right here. It's not your ultimate protection, but it's a good temporary protection, a good temporary shelter. Because this knowing doesn't get destroyed by anything. Whatever happens, you keep knowing, knowing, knowing. And your skill lies in separating the knowing from its objects. So you start that by immersing yourself in the breath, really getting one with the breath. So it gives you a good, solid foundation, and then whatever else comes up in the mind, you can say, well, that's not where I am. That's not me. It's a process. And I can get involved in the process if I want to, but I don't have to if it's going to be harmful. And John Mahabua once commented that after John Munn passed away, he was feeling really lost. He had lost his teacher. He said he was like a, an animal in the forest. If he had any diseases, there was no doctor to look after him. But then he caught himself. He said, well, wait a minute, there are all the things that a John Munn taught. He could use those as his teacher. And what, was, what was the point he stressed more than anything else? He says, have a very clear sense of the knower, just the observer, that awareness that just watches things no matter what happens. And when anything comes up in the meditation that you're not sure about, just stay with the knower. And no matter what, you'll be safe. Now, this doesn't apply just to the meditation. Anything that comes up in, the life, if you have, in your life, you have a strong sense of just being the knower, or being aware of things. So well, this is what human life is like then you don't get swept away. You're not holding on to any umbrellas or parachutes that are going to catch the wind, knock you off your feet. And in doing this, it's not that you're heartless, but the more solid you can be in this awareness, the more you have to offer other people. Because you see everybody else being blown around. 
And one of the best gifts you can give them is not being blown. You can keep your head, no matter what the circumstances. So this is an important skill. This little exercise we're doing here with the breath, trying to stick with the breath, learn to get involved and engrossed in the breath so you can get really firmly implanted in the breath. Because in the course of that you don't just learn about the breath, you learn about the mind. And you learn about how you can begin to disentangle yourself from all the thought processes that would lead to harm and suffering. And as you get more and more skilled in this area, you begin to discover more than just this sense of the observer. There's something deeper inside as well. It's totally unconditioned. It doesn't require mindfulness or anything at all to maintain it. When you find that, as the Buddha said, you've gained your foothold in the deathless. In other words, the images of crossing a river, and you finally get to the point where you're nearing the farther, further shore. And your feet can reach the bottom of the river. You're much safer. You're not going to get swept away by the currents. And from there it's only a short distance to the shore. We can stand on firm ground. and the river can't sweep you away. But even before you reach the further shore, you've got this island in the middle of the river. The island comes from developing mindfulness. It's being with a body in and of itself. Abandoning greed and distress with reference to the world, i.e. the world that's swept away down the river. This is where you can stay. This is where you're safe. So do your best to stay with the island. So you can be an island of calm in the midst of this swirling world we have. So when aging, illness, and death, and separation just come jumping into the present moment, you're not going to get up knocked over. They don't fill your awareness, because you've, you've already learned how to inhabit your awareness here in the present moment. And these other things won't be able to gain a foothold. It's the image the Buddha gives of a mind that's firmly concentrated. The unconcentrated mind where you, your awareness is not filling the body, he says, is like a ball of wet clay. You throw a stone into it and the stone gains entry into the wet clay. But once you fully inhabit the present moment, it's like having a solid wood door. And you throw a ball of string in the door and the string doesn't gain entry into the wood. Try to make your awareness, try to make your sense of conscious awareness fill in the body that solid. and nothing will knock you over. It's when you let your emotions get so big that they fill your whole body. You give them entry into the body, then they seem to be overwhelming. But if you occupy the body first and stay there, they can't push themselves in. They push themselves in a little bit and you can push them back. So try to keep this sense of awareness, this full awareness of the present moment, as strong as you can. That's your first line of protection. <laughs>